I was coming home from school with my mother. She was holding my hand. In the other hand, I clutched my turkey. The ones we made in first grade the week before Thanksgiving. I was so proud of mine, I was practically shitting nickels. What you did, see, was put your hand on a piece of construction paper and then trace around it with a crayon. That made a tail and a body. When it came to the head, you were on your own. I showed mine to mom and she's all, yeah, 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 right, 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 totally great. But I didn't think she ever really saw it. She was probably thinking about one of the books she was trying to sell. Flogging the pro- Mom was a literary agent, see. It used to be her brother, my Uncle Harry. But mom took over his business a year before the time I'm telling you about. It's a long story and kind of a bummer. I said, I used forest green because it's my favorite color. You knew that, right? We were almost at our building by then. It was only three blocks from my school. She's all, yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, you play or watch Barney and the Magic School Bus when we get home, kiddo. I've got a zillion calls to make. So I go, yeah, 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 which earned me a poke and a grin. I loved it when I could make my mother grin because even at six, I knew that she took the world very serious. Later on, I found out part of the reason was me. She thought she might be raising a crazy kid. The day I'm telling you about was one when she decided for sure I wasn't crazy after all, which must have been sort of a relief and sort of not. You don't expect anybody to talk about this. You don't talk to anybody about this, she said to me later that day, except to me. And maybe not even me, kiddo, okay? I said okay. When you're little and it's your mom, you say okay to everything. Unless she says it's bedtime, of course. Or to finish your broccoli. We got to our building and the elevator was still broken. You could say things might have been different if it had been working, but I don't think so. I think that people who say life is all about the choices we make and the roads we go down are full of shit. Because check it. Stairs or elevator, we still would have come out on the third floor. When the fickle finger of fate points at you, all roads lead to the same place. And that's what I think. I may change my mind when I'm older, but I really don't think so. Fuck this elevator, Mom said. Then, you didn't hear that, kiddo. Hear what? I said, which got me another grin. Last grin for her that afternoon, I can tell you. I asked her if she wanted me to carry her bag, which had a manuscript in it like always. That day a big one. Looked like a 500 pager. Mom always sat on the bench reading while she waited for me to get out of school. If the weather was nice. She said, sweet offer, but what do I always tell you? You have to tote your own burden in life, I said. Correctamundo. Is it Regis Thomas, I asked? Yes, indeed. Good old Regis, who pays our rent. Is it about, uh, Roanoke? Do you even have to ask Jamie? Which made me snicker. Everything good old Regis wrote was about Roanoke. That was the burden he toted in life. We went up the stairs to the third floor, where there were two other apartments plus ours at the end of the hall. Ours was the fanciest one. Mr. and Mrs. Burkett were standing outside 3A, and I knew right away something was wrong because Mr. Burkett was smoking a cigarette which I hadn't seen him do before and it was illegal in our building anyway. His eyes were bloodshot, and his hair was all crazed up in gray spikes. I always called him Mr., but he was actually Professor Burkett and taught something smart in NYU. English and European literature, I later found out. Mrs. Burkett was dressed in a nightgown and her feet were bare. That nightgown was pretty thin. I could see most of her stuff right through it. My mother said, Marty? What's wrong? Before he could say anything back, I showed him my turkey. Because he looked sad and I wanted to cheer him up. But also because I was so proud of it. Look, Mr. Burkett, I made a turkey. Look, Mrs. Burkett. I held it up for her in front of my face because I didn't want her to think I was looking at her stuff. Mr. Burkett paid no attention. I don't think he even heard me. Tia, I have some awful news. Mona died this morning. My mother dropped her bag with the manuscript inside it between her feet and put her hand over her mouth. Oh no! Tell me that's not true! He began to cry. She got up in the night and said she wanted a drink of water. I went back to sleep and she was on the couch this morning with a comforter pulled over her chin, so I tiptoed to the kitchen and put on the coffee because I thought a pleasant smell would 
who would wake? Who would wake? He really broke down then. Mom took him in her arms the way she did me when I hurt myself, even though Mr. Burkett was about a hundred. Seventy-four, I later found out. That was when Mrs. Burkett spoke to me. She was hard to hear, but not as hard as some of them because she was still pretty fresh, she said. Turkeys aren't green, James. Well, mine is, I said. My mother is still holding Mr. Burkett and kind of rocking him. They didn't hear her because they couldn't. They didn't hear me because they were doing adult things. Comforting for Mom, blubbering for Mr. Burkett. Mr. Burkett said, I called Dr. Allen and he came and said she probably had a soak. At least that's what I thought he said. He was crying so much it was hard to tell. He called the funeral parlor. They took her away. I don't know what I'll do without her. Mrs. Burkett said, My husband is going to burn your mother's hair with a cigarette if he doesn't look out. Sure enough, he did. I could smell the singeing hair, a kind of beauty shop smell. Mom was too polite to say anything about it, but she made him let her go. Mom was too polite to say anything about it, but she made him let go of her, and then she took the cigarette from him and dropped it on the floor and stepped on it. I knew that talking to Mrs. Burkett anymore would freak him out. Mom, too. Even a little kid knows certain basic things if he's not soft in the attic. You said please. You said thank you. You didn't flap your weenie around in public or chew with your mouth open, and you didn't talk to dead folks when they were standing next to living folks who were just starting to miss them. I only want to say in my own defense that when I saw her I didn't know she was dead. Later on I got better at telling the difference, but back then I was just learning. It was her nightgown I could see through. Not her. Dead people look like living people, except they're always wearing the clothes they died in. Meanwhile, Mr. Burkett was rehashing the whole thing. He told my mother how he sat on the floor beside the couch and held his wife's hand till the doctor guy came and again till the mortician guy came to take her away. Conveyed her hence was what he actually said, which I didn't understand until Mom explained to me. And at first I thought she said, beautician. Maybe because of the smell when he burned Mom's hair? His crying had tapered off, but now it ramped up again. Her rings are gone, he said through his tears. Both her wedding rings and her engagement ring. That big diamond. I looked on the night table by her side of the bed, where she puts them when she rubs that awful smelling arthritis cream into her hands. It does smell bad, Mrs. Burkett admitted. Lanolin is basically sheep dip, but it really helps. I nodded to show I understood, but didn't say anything. And on the bottom sink because sometimes she leaves them there. I looked everywhere. They'll turn up, my mother soothed, and now that her hair was safe, she took Mr. Burkett in her arms again. They'll turn up, Marty. Don't you worry about that. I miss her so much. I miss her already. Mrs. Burkett flapped a hand in front of her face. I give him six weeks before he's asking Dolores Magowin out to lunch. Mr. Burkett was blubbering, and my mother was doing her soothing like she had did to me whenever I scraped my knee. Or this one time when I tried to make her a cup of tea and I slopped hot water on my hand. Lots of noise, in other words. So I took a chance, but kept my voice low. Where are your rings, Mrs. Burkett? Do you know? They have to tell you the truth when they're dead. I didn't know that at the age of six. I just assumed all grown-ups told the truth, living or dead. Of course, back then I also believed Goldilocks was a real girl. Call me stupid if you want to. At least I didn't believe the three bears actually talked. Top shelf of the hall closet, she said, way in the back behind the scrapbooks. Why there? I asked, and my mother gave me a strange look. As far as she could see, I was talking to an empty doorway, although by then she knew I wasn't quite the same as other kids. After a thing that happened in Central Park, not a nice thing, I'll get to it. I overheard her telling one of her editor friends on the phone that I was Faye. That scared the shit out of me, because I thought she meant she was changing my name to Faye, which is a girl's name. I don't have the slightest idea, Mrs. Burkett said. By then I suppose I was having the stroke. My thoughts would have been drowning in blood. Thoughts drowning in blood. I'll never forget that. Mom asked Mr. Burkett if he wanted to come down to our apartment for a cup of tea, or something stronger. But he said no. He was going to have another hunt for his wife's missing rings. She asked him if we would like us to bring him some Chinese takeout, which was my mother's planning for dinner. And she said that would be a good idea. Thank you, Tia. My mother said de nada, which she used almost as much as yeah, 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 and right, right, right. 
That's when we'd bring it to his apartment around six, unless he wanted to eat with us in ours, which he was welcome to do. He said no. He'd like to eat in his place, but he would like us to eat with him. Except what he actually said was our place, like Mrs. Burkett was still alive, which she wasn't, even though she was there. By then you'll have found her rings, Mom said. She took my hand. Come on, Jamie. We'll see Mr. Burkett later, but for now let's leave him alone. Mrs. Burkett said, Turkeys aren't green, Jamie, and that doesn't look like a turkey anyway. It looks like a blob with fingers sticking out of it. You're no Rembrandt. Dead people have to tell the truth, which is okay when you want to know the answer to a question, but as I said, the truth can really suck. I started to be mad at her, but just then she started to cry and I couldn't be. She turned to Mr. Burkett and said, We'll make sure you don't miss the belt loop on the back of your pants now, Dolores Magowan. I should smile and kiss a pig. She kissed his cheek, or kissed at it. I couldn't really tell which. I loved you, Marty. Still do. Mr. Burkett raised his hand and scratched a spot where her lips had touched him, as if he had an itch. I suppose that's what he thought it was.